the church as a series. And when we look at the church, it's not a building like we see here, but rather it is a collection of people. We are the body of Jesus Christ, and we are the church. From the very beginning, as we travel back even to the Old Testament with the Jews, we've seen that God has already always called his people out of the world. They were not to be mingled in and mixed in, but rather he has called them out to be separate. When we look at that word for ecclesia, it literally talks about how the church is not part of this world, but rather that it is completely separate. And how it refers to called out ones, how God's people are always called out. Come out from, a be, from among them and be separate. We then looked at, last week, the foundation or the building of the church. And what is the chief cornerstone of the church? Or who is the chief cornerstone of the church? Jesus. Jesus. And that chief cornerstone, the reason that is so important is that is a stone that relays to everybody else building the building where each other stone lay, lies. So the chief cornerstone is a stone that sets everything when it comes to the formation of the church. From there, who makes up the blocks of the church? The very foundation. Who started the very foundation of the blocks of the church? You have Jesus Christ as the chief cornerstone. Then who else starts building on the church? The, the apostles and the prophets. They are the stones that form the foundation. And then from there, we build on to the church. And the church is not a physical building block, but it is a spiritual building block. The Bible says that we are lively stones. Why is that? Because the church isn't just a building. We call it a church and we commonly assemble here. And it's nice to have air conditioning and lights and a place to gather and not have to worry about persecution at this point in time. And we can come in freedom to worship God. But the church is not this building. The church itself is the people. Now today we're going to talk a little bit about what is the purpose of the church. If someone would please read Mark chapter 16, 15. Mark 16, 15. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And then in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 12, the Bible reads, For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. And if we would back into verse 11, it would say this is why he gave apostles and prophets and teachers and preachers. But what was the purpose for them giving them? God giving those gifts to the church for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, and for the edifying <laughs> of the body of Christ. So really, when you get down to the basics of the church, it is the evangelism of the world, the edification of the body, the education of the body, and when we do all these, then finally, and we won't talk about this today at all, but the glorification of the body of Jesus Christ, because when we are doing what he tells us to, we are glorifying Christ in our actions. So, according to Revival Outside the Walls, they have a website in which they have a ton of statistics. But they made the statement that 51 per, and their statistics go back several years. I suppose look at one that was six, uh, 2016 and 2014. So, it's not like they were 2019, but they were still here, at least I'm sure, since 2000. But 51% of U.S. churchgoers say that they never heard the term the Great Commission. So the church is a collection of believers. And this collection of believers, as we've already stated and we are aware, they form the church. We are the church. Not this building. We are the church. And we're not a secluded group. What do I mean by not a secluded group? There are some organizations throughout the world that you have to be the right person and know the right people to get into. And you have to maybe have so much money or you have to know a certain handshake or this and that. And 
we won't let you in. In fact, there's some churches that are like that. You know, it's us four and no more. And if you're not the right caliber of person or make them enough income or whatever, they don't want you there. They're content exactly what they're uh, the way that they are. But this is not the way that the church is meant to be. The Bible says that Jesus came to seek and save that which is lost. That includes those that we might think are not exactly all there or a little bit eccentric or when it gets down to it, everybody has a soul and the only person that they need to know to become part of the church is Jesus Christ. That is the only requirement. It doesn't matter how much money you have. It doesn't matter who you know besides Jesus. When it gets down to it as a church, all Everyone is included. Anyone can be a part of the church assuming that they confess their sins, ask Christ to forgive them of their sins, and accept Christ as their personal Savior. And any more in life, I find that I have to break it down. I know we all know this, but we are living in a society when people, people go to church thinking they're saved, and they're living blankly in sin. There are people that uh, think that they're saved, and as long as they do right and by, um, they're good works. The truth of the matter is, it doesn't matter anything, all, all, it doesn't matter any of that stuff. If you have not confessed your sins, accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, stop <laughs> doing that sin. That is salvation. Christ left instructions for the church to follow, and it is not us for and no more. But rather, he told us to go out and to win the lost. We come back to the Great Commission of Mark 16, 15. Go ye into all the world and greet, preach the gospel to every creature. You know, there's a lot of people that think that's just a suggestion or it's just in the Bible, and they don't actually follow it. In fact, if we were to be honest, if we backed up and thought about our own life, when was the last time we invited somebody to church? Not even tell them about Jesus Christ, not ask them how they're living and if they know that they're living in sin and that they need Jesus to forgive them of their sins before it's late. How many of us have simply asked somebody to come to church? When we look at the Great Commission, it is not the great suggestion. It is not just something that's in the Bible, but it is a command. We talked about last week in a little bit with the word commission. Somebody entrusted to do something for somebody else. And we went through that big long list of definitions just off of Mary and Webster's dictionary. Nothing spiritual, but rather we learned that a commission is somebody who has been entrusted from somebody else to do a job that they can no longer do or to do something specific. And that is exactly what the Great Commission is. Jesus Christ entrusting us and giving us a power to go out and preach the gospel or tell others about him and how to get saved. I mean, after all, uh, we are commanded to do this. And this is exactly what Christ did in his ministry. If someone would please read Luke 19 and verse 10. Luke 19 and verse 10. The Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. The Son of Man has come to seek and save that which is lost. He didn't come for us for no more. But he came to seek and to save that which is lost. When we look at that one word seek, that doesn't mean those that are right there in front of us, that as we're standing in line in Walmart and we're stuck there waiting for the note and another register, knowing that they're not going to, and know we're going to be there for half an hour and we start talking to the person in front of us. Hey, you go to church. But the word seek implies that you're going out, that you're putting effort in, that you're going into the hard places. He has come to seek and save that which is lost. When we look at evangelism, it consists of two aspects, at least in our words or our vernacular, and that would be missions. And that falls into local missions and foreign missions. The foreign missions we're all most uh, familiar with probably because we collect up an offering, we send down to the missionary, and the missionary does the job. We support the missionary on the field. Or maybe we'll put together a care package or get together some Bibles and ship it overseas to the missionary for, to help out with their needs. And, or maybe get them tracks sent to their location in the language that they're uh, 
ministering at or evangelizing. And that's all great. But we cannot forget local missions or home missions. That is us going out to our own area to seek and save that which is lost. To tell them about Jesus. Maybe give a Bible to somebody who doesn't have a Bible. Uh, help out somebody who doesn't who needs help in a certain area. Maybe somebody need, doesn't have the money for milk or something and they need whatever it would be. Local missions falls into all forms. Um, here when the apartments opened up as a church, we put together care packages and put it in a pamphlet for the church and uh, we had a block layout advertisement in there and we went out for the first group and batch that were there and handed it door to door and made sure that they got one so they knew that we were here. We had our beliefs in there the best we could. Local missions falls into all kinds of different categories. Now, according to, and we need to go out and invite people to come to church and to show them their need for Jesus before it's too late. We find this in Luke chapter 14 and verse 23. Where the Bible reads, and the Lord said unto the servant, Go out into the highways and hedges and compel them to come in, that my house might be filled. Here is another perfect example that Christ said to go out and seek them, find them. Because if we are looking at this account, does anybody know what parable this is? This is the one where people are invited to the wedding. Great supper. And do the invited guests come? No. no. So what does the master of the house tell them to do? And did he tell them to look for a particular set of people? No. Nope. Make sure they had money? Anybody. Anybody. But what if their clothing isn't what they're supposed to be? I mean, in the presence of a king and a wedding, you have to have nice clothing. But he also said, bring them in, we'll dress them. We'll give them garments. When it comes to evangelism, it doesn't matter who you are. Everyone born and breathing either one day is going to end up in heaven or hell. It doesn't matter if we consider them weird, eccentric, if they don't have the nicest clothing. At this point in time, maybe they have the worst mouth out there. Maybe they're always cursing, but Jesus changes all that. We're not sent out to change them and clean them up on the outside, but we're sent out to compel them to come in. Do you know Jesus as your personal Savior? Would you like to know him? Let me tell you about a man that knew all things, that even I didn't know. We need to go out and invite people to come to church and show them their need for Jesus. We've heard it said oftentimes, maybe we will be the only Jesus that people will ever see. I don't have the statistics in our notes, but do you realize that when it, even come, when it comes to inviting people to church or getting them to church, most people will come to church if somebody invites them. And the chances are greater if they're invited by somebody they know. But are we content with just showing people Jesus on the outside are we actually inviting people to church? Are we telling them about Jesus? Are we letting them know that, you know what, there's coming a day when we all will have to give an account of our life to God, and if we're not covered in the precious blood of Jesus, you're not getting into heaven. And if we got down to the brass tacks, really, the Jehovah Witnesses and the Mormons put us Pentecostals to shame. When it comes to door to door and spreading, quote unquote, their religion and telling people from the Bible, I've had more Jehovah Witnesses come to my house since I've lived there than any other group out there. And they don't come out necessarily saying, let me tell you about Jesus, but what do you think about this verse? Now, I'm not going on with their methods, but the fact of the matter is, if that was, if we went through life, how many houses could we knock on that said, you know, since I've lived here, somebody from this church invited me. As much as we knock on the Jehovah Witnesses really put us to shame in that aspect. They really, really do. 
when it looked, um, according to, and all these statistics are going to come from a revival outside the walls on their website, but 93% of practicing Christians aren't comfortable to have a conversation about the Lord, even with their own grandchildren. Two-thirds of all American churches are experiencing either one, no growth, and two, a decline in numbers. 24 out of 25 millennials don't have a biblical worldview. 70% of those attending church one or more times a month never share their faith with a stranger. 51% of churchgoers don't believe that sharing their faith is an essential obligation of their Christian life. One third of all Americans believe that they, that believe after they die, and get this, one third of all Americans believe that after they die, God will give them a second chance. The purpose of the church is to go out and fulfill the Great Commission. He said, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. What are we commanded to do? We're commanded to do exactly what Christ was doing before. And what does that come down in biblical terms? To seek and save that which is lost. We don't have the saving power, but we can point them to the one who does. And it's not enough anymore to ask people, if you die right now, would you go to heaven, go to heaven or hell? But we might have to get more technical on have you accepted, um, have you confessed your sins? Have you accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? Have you stopped church doing those things? Because there might be people out there that say, yes, I confess my sins. If you go to, if you're Catholic, yeah, you go to confession. Yes, I've confessed my sins. Have you asked Jesus to forgive me? Well, you don't know what their minds has been trained to do or what, the way they're thinking. If you have a Catholic, I have you asked Jesus to forgive me of my sins? They might start thinking, well, the priest acts in the place of Jesus, so yes, I have asked Jesus to forgive me of my sins. Have you stopped doing your sins? You know, we're living in a very, in an age where if we really took eternity seriously, we would do everything we could to make sure that people understood that heaven is forever, hell's forever, and we want to make sure that we're reaching them down on their level because not everybody has the same way of thinking. But are we doing our best to reach out to them? When it comes to evangelism, it's not just a matter of telling people about Jesus, but what did Jesus do throughout his ministry? The Bible says that signs and water shall fall on them that believe. And we look throughout the book of Acts, especially, were there any that came to Christ because of the signs and wonders? Absolutely. Sometimes preaching wasn't just enough. But they want to know that what you have is real. What you have is genuine. There are countries that if you go over there as a Christian and you preach that Jesus can heal you, they're going to be in that audience looking for somebody to get healed in that manner. And if they don't, guess what they're going to do? They're going to kill you because what you have is faith. Jesus went out and he cast out devils. In Mark chapter 16 and 17, would someone like to read that? You might as well just hold that passage. I'll have you read. Go ahead and read verse 18 too. So Mark 16, 17, and 18. So you shall cast out demons. You shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. Signs and wonders shall follow them that believe. Signs and wonders are not always an approval of God's, of somebody's lifestyle, because God will use whoever's willing. They may not be living right. They may not be acting right. Maybe, and maybe it's something that's hidden. You don't know it. But what we do know is there'll be many on that day that do signs and wonders. Say, Lord, we've done this and we've done that. And you'll say, I have a new. But, as the true church of the living God, we are to go out and win the lost, 
We are to go out and tell them about Christ, and signs and wonders shall follow, the, follow those that believe. If we go to the book of Acts, I believe it is Simon Magus, that sorcerer that followed the revival in Samaria, and I believe it was Peter, that when he saw them casting out demons and healing the sick, that he tried to buy the Holy Ghost. He didn't realize what it was. It, but what it was was he knew there was something more powerful and something he didn't have. People may not always come to Christ because of the signs and wonders, but they are there as a sign that what you have is real, that God is real, and that there's something greater that they don't have. And even when it comes to local missions, casting out demons, we may not necessarily be going uh, house to house and saying, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus, the devil come out. That would be a little silly. But one of the most neglected practices of the church is out of prayer. And it is in prayer where we get victory over situations. It's in prayer where we get victories over strongholds. It's in prayer where the power of the Holy Ghost comes down and pulls down strongholds. And even in the area that we're living in, we need to be praying against the powers of the devil. I forget who it was that made the statement that all it takes for an evil to prevail, prevail is for good men to do nothing. Are we praying against the workings of the devil? Are we praying against his workings in our community? Are we rebuking him in the name of Jesus? Are we putting up, praying that God will set a special hedge of protection around our town, our valley? Are we going to war against the devil in prayer on our knees? Now, when it comes to these, all this takes prayer not just physically, but it takes place in our prayer closets as well, some of it. Because that's where we get personal with God. That's where we get more power with God. But are we working against the enemy? Are we working that others might come to him, come to Christ? Moving on, the next thing is we are to edify one another. When we look at John chapter 13 and verse 14, John 13, 14, someone go ahead and read that. John 13, 14. We are to serve one another. When it comes to edifying and building up, we do it by serving one another. In John chapter 15 and verse 12, we do it through love. John 15. John 15 and verse 12. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. And we know how much God loved us because in verse 13 it tells us, Greater love hath no man than this, than a man lay down his life for his friends. If we are to supposed to edify one another, we do it through serving one another, but we do it out of serving one another through love. It makes a big difference when we do that. Love prefers someone else over itself. We are to love our brothers and our sisters more than we love ourselves. If someone would please read Romans chapter 12 and verse 10. And then just hold that and I'll have you flip over to verse uh, Romans 13 if you don't mind. Since it's right there. Romans 12, 10. So through loving one another, uh, we are to love our brothers and sisters more than we love ourselves. And what about Romans 13, 8? Oh, no man is safe, but to love one another, bring that love to another, have to fulfill the law. So by loving one another, it's not just the way that we're supposed to treat one another, but when we love one another in Christ, we are fulfilling the law itself. And then we are to encourage one another. We find that in Romans 15 and verse 14. Romans 15, 14. Where the Bible reads, And I myself also am persuaded of you, my brethren, that ye are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, able also to admonish one another. 
So admonish, encourage one another. We are to be an encouragement to one another as we travel through. So the church is here to uh, evangelize, but we're also here for edification, edifying one another, lifting up. Is that not what Paul did throughout his ministry? Why did he write all those letters to all those churches? Some of it was rebuke, but the reason for the rebuke was he was hoping to build them up. It was constructive criticism. It was for teaching. It was for education. But we are to edify one another, encourage one another. Sometimes this may include constructive criticism, and I use that loosely because there are people and Christians that take this to the extreme. They look for every little flaw. <laughs> I'm not talking about that, but if you know some, some your brother or sister's taking it at fall, you might want to bring it to their attention. Just let them say, you know what? I'm praying for you. Not a, you did this. I saw it. We're going to tell everybody. But rather, it is for edification to build up. What is the purpose of criticism, uh, constructive criticism, even when it comes to the workplace? Why do parents and grandparents? criticize their children and grandchildren, it's not to tear down, but it's to build up. You messed up this time, but when it, you approach a situation again, this is how you should go about it. And is that biblical? If it's done in the right spirit, absolutely. And I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. <laughs> but we're to encourage one another in the Greek word, that means to admonish, put mind, to caution, or reprove gently. Like I said, it's not a beating or bashing over the head. So we looked at the purpose of the church is for to evangelize, to edify, and then finally we get to the education. Because what did the Apostle Paul uh, write? I would not have you to be ignorant. You know, there are people that do ignorant things only because they've never been told about it. There are, even when it comes to the um, church itself, there's people that would say, well, I wish we lived in an Acts church. We need an Acts church. We need an Acts church. Well, maybe the signs and wonders were good, but there was a whole lot of ignorance that went on in the old church, too, when it comes to the book of Acts. We know more than they do because Paul instructed us. Why? Because Paul instructed us how to use the gifts. If it wouldn't, he says to use them for love. He told us about the gifts. The early church, they didn't have that. It was a personal experience. They had the Old Testament, but they didn't have the writing of Paul until later on. They didn't have the New Testament. But education. This is why God gave us the gifts in the first place. In Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 through 12, and we'll go back and read that. Ephesians 4, verses 11 and 12, where the Bible reads, And he gave some apostles, and some prophets, and some evangelists, and some pastors, and some teachers. Why did he give these? Because in verse 12, for the perfecting the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. So God gave, Christ gave gifts to the church, to educate us, to edify us, to build us up. And he gave us apostles, preachers, teachers, and evangelists. The next thing I see is the Word of God tells us that, informs us that we need to study and to educate ourselves. What does 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15 state? 2 Timothy 2, 15. So did he say go and listen to somebody else teach? No. He said study. That implies personal application, personal involvement. You know, for the first part, at least I find this is true, I, pro I think I probably get a little bit more retainment of Sunday school and everything I teach than everybody else, and it's from the aspect of teacher because I spend a lot more time with it. But the fact of the matter is, it doesn't change any different that you're supposed to study, I'm supposed to study, Sister Beth is supposed to study, the pastor is supposed to study. We're all supposed to study the Word of God to the best of our ability. 
And the Bible tells us why. To show us ourselves approved unto God. The truth of the matter is, if we truly want to know God, we're going to try to seek out the answer, which means we're going to study for ourselves. So we get education through others, as we've read in Ephesians, the gifts that God, Christ has given us, through educating ourselves. We are instructed to determine what the truth is for ourselves. 1 John chapter 4, verse 1. Where the Bible states, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. So we are to study for ourselves. John didn't write and say, trust the pastor and believe him for yourself, but rather he said, there's many false prophets that have gone out. You study, you try the spirits, you know them for yourself. You determine what the truth is. And watch out for deception in the church. Peter even wrote about that in 2 Peter 2.1, and we're just going to move on and finish up here quickly. So, God gave us gifts, apostles, prophets, for us to learn. He's commanded us to study on our own. But then, we're also commanded to pass on what we know. We are to educate the saints. We find that in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 2. If someone has that good, just go ahead and read that, please. <clears throat> Preach the word, be instant in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort. What is that? That's someone taking what they know and passing it on. Taking, educating others. When we look even at women in the church in Titus chapter 2, verses 3 through 5, and we won't read it for the sake of time, but women are instructed to teach other women. Let the elder women instruct the younger women in the church. And then finally in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, and verse 3, we discover that it is through education that we protect the flock, including ourselves. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 3. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there be a great falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, and the son of perdition. So it is... We, through education that we are aware that there's going to be a great fall as a But it's because of that that we know that we try to protect the flock. We instruct them in the right path. So when it comes to the church, what is the purpose of the church? It is evangelism. It is edification of the body of believers. It is the education of us among with other, us educating other believers. And then finally one we did not discuss, but rather when we do all these things, it, and we are living right, it is the glorification of Jesus Christ. Because when we are living right, when we are acting right, when we are following the word to a T, Christ is pleased in our actions and our doings. And when we are functioning the way the church is supposed to be functioning, we are glorifying God in our lives. Does anybody have any thoughts, any questions, anything that they want to add at this point in time? If not, let us bow our heads and we'll prepare our hearts for service. Gracious Heavenly Father, we give you all praise and glory for everything you've done for us and shall continue to do. Lord, we thank you that your God who reigns on high that there's none like you, Lord. Even right now, we rebuke every attack of the enemy that should come our way. We pray that you set your angels at the four corners of the property above and below, that no attack of the enemy may penetrate. I pray that our hearts and our minds will be in one mindset and one accord, that we may worship you in sincerity and truth, that the Holy Ghost may move, having his way as he so desires, Lord. I pray that our hearts and our minds will be positive, be with, that they would be good soil for your word to fall on, that we may remember it throughout the week, but even greater than that, that we would apply it to our lives, that we would be transformed into your very image, Lord. I pray, Lord, that we would have a greater desire and burden to be the church that you desire us to be, Lord. 
and that we would go out in all might and power of the Holy Ghost, Lord, confident knowing that you will work on our behalf. For we don't go in our own might, we don't go in our own power, but we go through the power of the Holy Ghost. And we ask all these, I know the song leader today, Lord, knowing his mind and his lips as he brings forth your word, as he leads us in the song, should have us to sing. Anoint the uh, musicians, Lord, as they praise you upon the strings of instruments and the vocal cords. And anoint the pastor's mind on his lips as he brings forth your word today. Give him a special blessing as well. We ask all these things in the name of Jesus and everyone said, Amen. Yeah, it, but it must.